thanks, Aku, for that wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you say when someone calls you handsome and smart? Uh, I don't know. You say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Aku. <laughs> Um, all right, so thanks everyone for coming. Thanks for inviting me, for having me here. Um, it's been a real pleasure so far, and uh, the rest of the program is looking good too, uh, at least as far as I can tell. I don't know about my own contributions, but the other stuff looks great. Um, so, as Aku said, a number of colleagues and myself, we've been engaged in a project on scientism. And the point of that project really was to take a close look at what scientism is, uh, how it's at work, in our contemporary culture, in science writing, in science itself, um, and also to critically evaluate it. So to think about what might be good and bad about it uh, and to come up with alternatives to it. So ways of taking science very seriously without thinking it's sort of the only thing we need to take seriously. Now, um, actually, we, so my colleagues and I, uh, oftentimes when we introduce this project, we were met with um, incredulous stares. So people thought it was sort of a weird or a mistaken thing to do to think so long and hard about scientism. And the reason was basically that they, they thought, well, nobody actually believes in scientism. Um, it's just this sort of straw man that some people set up um, you know, to, as a foil for their own views. So, you know, particularly religious people are suspected of doing this. So they think, I mean, there are these religious people who want to sort of, you know, mark off their, their own terrain. And because they want to do that, they accuse others of being uh, believers in science or, or sci adherents of scientism. Um, but no serious uh, scientist or no serious philosopher actually believes in scientism. Um, so, you know, the suggestion is we are mistaken in, in thinking about scientism. And, if, I mean, admittedly, um, it, it's not unheard of for philosophers to, you know, combat straw men, or women maybe, too. Um, but I actually think, um, I mean, there's, so, I mean, I want to take this charge seriously. So that's why I started looking, in particular, at uh, popular science writing. And of course, also at philosophy, but I'm not going to talk about too much philosophy today. I'll, I'll do more philosophy tomorrow. But um, so I started looking at popular science books. So you know the stuff you find in bookstores uh, about free will, about neuroscience, about religion, and all these sorts of things. So popular accounts of scientific insights. And um, I wanted to look at whether there actually was something like scientism at work in these books. And I mean, I'm going to show you that there is. I mean, so the influence of scientism is pervasive in these books. So a number of best-selling popular science books actually seem to be heavily influenced by scientism. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a, that's a bad thing, I think. And I'll explain, you, I'll explain to you in more detail why, why I think that. Um, but this also means that it isn't just, scientism isn't just this sort of straw man. Uh, it's really something out there. Now, so first of all, I mean, popular science is great, right? Um, I'm assuming that some of you will have read at least some of these books, and of course there are many more. So Richard Dawkins' Blind Watchmaker, for instance, absolutely wonderful book. It's brilliant. I mean, it's probably the best explanation of evolution you could wish for. Um, Consciousness Explained by Daniel Dennett, also very well known, maybe a little more speculative, but also, I mean, it does an excellent job of relating science and philosophy and um, all right, so it's, it's wonderful stuff. And I think it's, it's not just wonderful and fun to read, it's also important. So these popular science books, they have an important role to play in our intellectual lives. Because uh, I think being uh, aware of what science has discovered, being aware of where science is going, is, is important. I mean, I actually think that sort of knowledge is something that's intrinsically valuable, especially if it's knowledge that's related to sort of important questions about what it is to be human, what it, where we come from, where we're going. Uh, but also, you might argue that if we're sort of, if we're going to be good citizens, well-informed people, we need to, you know, be aware of what the current state of science is, and at least, you know, and how much awareness we can muster is going to vary from one person to the next. But I mean, especially for people who, um, who go to college or university, 
um, I mean, they should have a sense of what, you know, where science is at. Um, now, what's going on in, in a number of these recent popular science books is that they're suggesting that science can basically provide answers to what we might call the big questions. And what I have in mind with big questions are so questions about the meaning of life, questions about what it is to be human, where we come from, so our ultimate origins, where we're going. So questions that have traditionally at least been thought to be within the domain of the humanities or perhaps more narrowly within the domain of philosophy or theology. Um, questions about the existence of God, for instance. But these popular science books suggest that, I mean, it's time for philosophers to step aside and for the scientists to finally answer these questions, or at least, I mean, if not to answer them, at least, you know, to make solid progress in trying to answer them. So I'll, I'll give you some uh, representative quotes here. Uh, there, there are many more, um, but here, here's, a, here's an impression of the kind of things you get. So Alex Rosenberg, uh, who's I guess sort of the most radical adherent of scientism you can find out there, uh, he's been mentioned before. So he basically says about the answers to those big questions, uh, science has found the answers. So I mean, it's not, <laughs> there's no uncertainty here. We know the answers. Some of them 400 years ago, others in the 19th century, and several others quite recently. And here he's thinking of you know, stuff in neuroscience, having to do with free will, rationality. Um, Franz de Waal, um, a, uh, originally Dutch, but he's worked in the US for a long time, a primatologist. Um, and he suggests that science can wrest morality from the hands of philosophers. So the idea is, you know, these philosophers have been trying to understand morality, it has come to nothing, so it's time for science to take over. Uh, Sam Harris, also um, quite a well-known figure, at least in America, a neuroscientist, he writes, free will is an illusion. So this is something science has established. Jesse Baring, um, a cognitive scientist of religion, or I think by now he is actually a popular science writer, but he used to be a cognitive science, scientist of religion. Um, and he suggests, well, perhaps the question of God's existence, so at least there's perhaps in there, so he's not as confident as Alex Rosenberg, but still, the suggestion is clear. So perhaps the question of God's existence is one that is more for psychologists than for philosophers, physicists, or even theologians. And this is something you find in a lot of popular science books. Um, and I'm going to sort of look more deeply into what's going on here. And what might be, uh, how actually so there is the influence of scientism behind this. So what I want to do, and this is just to give you the, uh, the agenda so you, know, you have a sense of where we're going, I want to say a little bit about um, scientism, how I understand the term, um, and how it sort of relates to philosophy, or, or not relates to philosophy. And then we'll actually look at some examples of scientism in action in popular science. Um, and in closing, I'll also say more about why I think this is important, so to be aware that there is this influence of scientism in a lot of popular science books, and something on how we can do better. Um, so we being uh, well, all of us, but also these popular science writers. All right, so let's start by being explicit about what I mean by scientism, because as, uh, as you've heard before, there are actually many versions, different versions of scientism out there. Um, and I'm going to be focusing mainly on something that has been called epistemological scientism, which is the idea that science is the only, or the best at least, source of rational beliefs or knowledge about ourselves and the world, about you know, everything, basically. Um, so science, scientific inquiry, is sort of the go-to place if you want to find answers to all of your questions. <clears throat> um, so this means that there's no room for things like philosophy, because science here stands for natural science mostly, or at least the methods of the natural sciences. So no, no room for philosophy, for literary studies. History is dubious, um, at least when it's, I mean, it doesn't use scientific methods. Um, our sort of common sense, religious traditions, all of that is out of the window. We need to turn to science for answers. All right, so, the, and it, of course, I mean, this is a pretty radical position. Nonetheless, I think you can see its influence actually in popular science books. 
Um, so it's not something that I've just made up. All right, so why do people believe this? Um, well, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't wanna uh, sort of speculate about their sort of internal motivations for believing these things, but um, there seem to be sort of two related reasons or related arguments or motivations behind belief in scientism. And first is obviously um, something you might call the a halo effect of science. And what I have in mind here is the fact that science has been immensely successful as a method or perhaps a collection of methods of finding out more about ourselves and the world. So science, in at least when sort of measured in certain ways, has been immensely successful in teaching us more about the world. And you might think, well, I mean, something that's so successful, um, it's a good idea to rely on that thing if we want to learn more about the world and ourselves. The second motivation, and I, I, I think this is something you sort of, I mean, maybe you've encountered it before when you've tried to discuss issues having to do with scientism or science and religion or philosophy. Um, so when you present it in a certain way, scientism can just look like basic common sense. It can look like something that's completely obvious. And what I mean is this. Um, if you ask yourself the question, well, um, how do we know things? How do we acquire knowledge? Well, you might think, well, how do we do it? Um, well, we, uh, well, sometimes we learn from others, of course, but then you know, those others would have had other ways of, of gathering their knowledge. So the, sort of the basic mechanisms that we have for, for acquiring knowledge are sort of you know, perception. We look around and we try to find out what's going on, and that's one way we come to know. Then we have our reasoning capabilities, so we sort of you know, take a bunch of observations and perceptions that we've made and try to draw conclusions from those. Um, and then, so the thought continues, well, I mean, what I'm describing here is basically just science, right? Because what we do in science is we just you know, look at the world in very systematic ways, or we isolate bits and pieces of the world and look at those in, 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 in systematic ways, and we try to draw conclusions from that. So, you yeah, know, there it is. If you want to acquire knowledge, you, you should rely on science, and that's it. Um, it seems like a commonsensical thing to say. I, I mean, I actually think, so I, I'm an epistemologist by training, so I think there's a lot going on here in, and a lot of sort of big steps are being made implicitly. Um, so that's why I included lack of philosophical training there uh, between uh, brackets. Because, I mean, this actually, what's going on here are some major steps or assumptions in the theory of knowledge and assumptions about what it means to, to acquire knowledge that are many of them actually highly problematic. And I'll, I'll look at problems of scientism in more detail uh, tomorrow, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on that now. But the thing is, um, when you sort of explain it in a certain way, it looks like common sense. That's the, I think, one reason why people actually believe in scientism. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about problems tomorrow. It's sort of tempting to go into them now, but I won't. Um, all right, so what this leads to if, so what this version of scientism, epistemological scientism, leads to is a dismissal of philosophy, a dismissal of theology, a dismissal of the humanities broadly. And I'll give you some examples of, um, of you know, the forms that this takes. Um, so if you think science is our only source of knowledge, you're going to think, well, things like conceptual analysis of thinking very uh, critically about what our concepts mean, uh, a priori reasoning, uh, so reasoning that doesn't rely on sense perception or doesn't take sort of things we've learned from sense perception into account. Uh, thought experiments or sort of common sense or religious traditions or what have you. You're going to think that all of those things are worthless or, well, at least maybe they're good for entertainment, but they're not serious sources of knowledge. Uh, there's nothing we can know um, very reliably uh, on the basis of those forms of forming beliefs. Uh, so and here's, a, um, here's a great quote. Uh, Steve Jones, a, a British, I think, geneticist. Um, so, and he, so he says, for most wearers of white coats, philosophy is to science as pornography is to sex. It is cheaper, easier, and some people seem bafflingly to prefer it. 
Well, I mean, this is very clever, of course, um, and it's funny, I think. Well, I think it's funny. Apparently, you don't really think it's funny. Nobody's laughing. <laughs> anyway, um, but of course, it's also grossly misleading, all right? Uh, so he sort of just assumes that science and philosophy are in the process of trying to find answers to the same questions, and then in trying to answer these questions, philosophy is just this inferior method. You know, the, the obviously better thing to do is to employ scientific methods, but some people, you know, for some weird reason, they prefer to rely on philosophy rather than you know, do the hard scientific work. You know, that's a misleading picture. I mean, it isn't obvious that philosophy is so much easier. It's not obvious that philosophy is trying to answer the same questions as science is. So all of that uh, he simply sort of forgets about. But anyway, um, this is sort of what epistemological scientism leads to. Another thing, and this has been mentioned before, um, another reason why adherents of scientism are critical of philosophy is that they think or assume um, that philosophers are completely ignorant of science and that is that it is therefore safe to just ignore their work because I mean science is our only source of knowledge so if someone doesn't know a lot about science there's nothing we can learn from this person and this is uh, Stephen Hawking I think in the in the preface to his the grand design book um, he writes philosophers have not kept up with modern developments in science particularly physics um, so, you know, forget about the community of philosophers of physics who actually sort of work on philosophical questions raised by physics. Stephen Hawking thinks that's all nonsense. These people don't know what they're talking about. Um, all right. And, so, and all these quotes I'm giving you are from well, best selling, super best selling to moderately best selling popular science books. Uh, so, this isn't, you know, some dark corner of your bookstore where I had to sort of mine crazy books for these quotes. I mean, this is readily available. Um, all right, so third thing, um, another reason that a lot of people uh, give for dismissing philosophy, so especially adherents of scientism, is that there's no progress, no consensus in philosophy. So Francis Crick um, writes, no longer uh, need one spend time attempting to endure the tedium of philosophers perpetually disagreeing with each other. Consciousness is now largely a scientific problem. Um, so again, the sentiment is these philosophers have worked on problems of consciousness for so long, they're still disagreeing with one another, there's no significant progress, you know, let's forget about them. So if you're an adherent of, of epistemological scientism, you're going to dismiss philosophy, theology, and humanities more broadly. Now, of course, you might think, you know, so what? <laughs> um, I mean, why is that a concern for any of us if we're not philosophers or theologians? Uh, maybe it's perfectly okay for these people to ignore philosophy. Well, I mean, actually, I think it's not. Uh, of course, I'm a philosopher, but because um, so let me show you what this leads to. And the, these are, I mean, it's sort of, okay, let me, I'll show it first and then I'll comment on it. So here's uh, a, a definition of free will, or actually two definitions of free will, that some scientists have given. Now, uh, the first one. Free will is the idea that we make choices and have thoughts independent of anything remotely resembling a physical process. That's an extremely weird definition of free will, right? It just sort of presupposes a form of dualism, sort of mind-body dualism, and then assumes that to have free will, there needs to be this immaterial soul floating free of anything physical. Now, I don't know any philosopher who actually endorses this definition of free will. Um, okay, so take Sam Harris, the second quote. To have free will, you would need to be aware of all the factors that determine your thoughts and action. And you would need to have complete control over those factors. So this is what he thinks it means to have free will. Uh, so complete awareness of everything that determines your behavior and complete control over all these things. Now, I mean, if this is your definition of free will, it's going to be pretty obvious that nobody has free will, right? But that, I mean, that just falls right out of the definition because of course we don't have complete awareness and complete control over all the factors determining how we think and act. 
But we knew that all along, right? I mean, people have talked for I don't know how long about the influence of your upbringing, of your social environment, and of maybe unconscious processes. Um, so we've known all of that for years. And again, there's no philosopher working on free will who would endorse this definition of free will. So what we have here is scientists ignoring uh, existing philosophical work on free will in particular, and then coming up with obviously faulty, I mean, borderline crazy definitions of free will. And that's just embarrassing, right? I mean, there's, I mean, so I'm not sort of suggesting that scientists would need to read the latest issue of every philosophy journal. Obviously, they shouldn't. Um, but, I mean, this is stuff that's just widely available, uh, like sort of standard definitions of free will that, that philosophers have given. That's simply available, I mean, probably even on Wikipedia. So you wouldn't even need to go to your library and you visit the philosophy section if that's too much. You can just find this on the internet easily. Um, so I think, I mean, and it's, but okay, so let me sort of <laughs> to heap on to uh, what I'm saying. Um, I mean, Sam Harris, he's written an, an entire book on free will and sort of allegedly demonstrating there is no such free as free will, uh, but it's premised on this definition of free will. So, I mean, the book is, I mean, insofar as it's trying to say anything about free will, it's just pointless. Right? I mean, it might be interesting insofar as you can learn more about the science that's relevant to free will, but where he's drawing conclusions about free will, I mean, given that he's working with this definition, there's simply nothing we can learn from it. Um, so, it, you know, it's a shame. Okay. Um, what I want to do next, as I announced, um, I want to look at some examples of um, popular science books, uh, two in particular, on morality. Here's um, Sam Harris and his book on morality, The Moral Landscape. Um, and I'll give you some of the highlights of the book, what he tries to uh, argue for in this book. The main point, main claim of the book, is basically that science can replace ethics. Right? So it's again so this attitude where uh, there are these traditional big questions about morality, about right and wrong good and bad. Uh, philosophers have worked on those questions for a long time, but now we have science and we can finally give answers, um, firmly established answers to those questions. So forget about the philosophers. All right, so a first point he tries to make is that the fact value distinction is irrelevant. It's a red herring. Uh, so philosophers traditionally distinguish between facts and values, right? So facts have to do with the way the world is, and values have to do with the way the world ought to be or ought not to be. And these are different things, right? You can't just conclude from the way the world is to the way it ought to be or ought not to be, right? That's trying to derive an ought from an is. And that's sort of, at least logically, that just doesn't follow. Um, now, he, I mean, he has different arguments. Um, for the, his conclusion that this is irrelevant or that there's no real distinction here. But one is particularly interesting, at least from our current perspective. Um, so he points to um, brain scans. And brain scans showing that when people think about facts and when people think about values, so the same regions of our brains are active. So there's um, activation in the same areas of our brain when we, when we think about these things. And he thinks you know, that's evidence that there is no real distinction there. And you might wonder, well, I mean, how does that follow? And he would be right. It doesn't, right? Because, I mean, from the mere fact that the same brain region is active when you think about one thing and another thing, of course, I mean, it doesn't follow at all that therefore there is no distinction between these things. I mean, suppose when you're thinking about reasoning and you know, it turns out that the same regions are active when you make a valid inference, so modus ponens, um, and an invalid one, um, you're, you're affirming the consequent. Does that therefore mean that there is no distinction between valid and invalid forms of reasoning? Of course not. It just, I, I don't know what it means exactly, I'm not a brain scientist, but 
I mean, it means that the same region in your brain is active, right? I mean, that seems safe. But of course, that doesn't mean very much about whether there are real distinctions out there in the phenomena that you're thinking about with your brain. Um, so a very remarkable argument. And you might think there is sort of scientism at work here. Um, because, of course, traditionally philosophers distinguish facts and values. But maybe, and this is a little speculative on my part, so maybe Sam Harris thinks, oh, you know, those philosophical distinctions, um, you know, that's not a reliable method of coming to know things. Instead, we should rely on science. And what we have here is brain scans sort of demonstrating these things. So, you know, we should just turn to science to look if there's a real distinction here, and therefore we should look at those brain scans. So it's sort of I mean, in this case, particularly excessive reliance on dubious scientific data, or, well, the data itself is not dubious, but its relevance is. Um, so it seems like a form of scientism. Okay, so this was a quick um, uh, side note. Uh, so let's go back to summarizing his main uh, points in the book. Um, so moral rightness, he thinks, is to be equated with the promotion of well-being. So the right thing to do is to promote well-being, always. So when we ask ourselves, you know, what should we do, or what policies should we implement, we should think about the uh, level of well-being that will result from implementing our actions or policies. And then we should choose the one which sort of leads to the highest level or the maximum level of well-being. Um, what exactly is well-being? Well, Harris thinks well-being is a completely natural property, so it's to be identified with things like mental and physical health, uh, emotional flourishing, as a feeling happy, more or less, um, a supportive social environment. So he thinks we don't have like a very precise definition, but we have a firm grasp of, sort of the main ingredients of well-being, and th and this, I mean, these are the main ingredients. Um, so, I mean, to those of you who have studied some ethics or a lot of ethics, uh, you will immediately recognize this as a form of consequentialism or utilitarianism, perhaps, where utility is sort of equated with well-being. Uh, you know, the, the morally right action is the one that leads to the, uh, the best consequences, where consequences here are cashed out in terms of well-being. All right, um, so how does he uh, reach all these conclusions? There's a, there's a telling footnote um, that I'll read to you. So he writes, I did not arrive at my position on the relationship between human values and the rest of human knowledge by reading the work of moral philosophers. I came to it by considering the logical implications of our making continued progress in the sciences of the mind. Um, so just to be clear, <laughs> there's no philosophy involved here. It's all you know, science and thinking about science. Okay, so this is his position, in, you know, or at least to the key components of it. Um, now, what about this? I mean, how should we think about this? Well, I mean, it's so I'm, I, I sort of feel uncomfortable or almost embarrassed, you know, to explain this because it's so obvious that he is making major leaps here. But then, I, I mean, I don't pretend to be offering any original criticisms here. A lot of people have pointed out problems in in his book, but I mean. I, when by sort of revisiting those criticisms, we can actually see that there is a kind of scientism at work here. So this sort of turning to science for, um, in this case, answers to moral questions. So first of all, uh, consequentialism, so which is sort of the normative theory he endorses, so the theory that says that the right thing to do is the one that leads to the, the most positive or the best consequences, I mean, it's highly controversial as a moral theory. Um, I mean, in, in, norm, in normative ethics, there's consequentialism, there's deontologism, sort of um, having to do with understanding morality in terms of fulfilling our duties and obligations, that's deontologism. And there's virtue ethics, which says that um, the morally right thing to do is what a virtuous person would do. And very, you know, I mean, of course, we need to explain what a virtuous person would do, and philosophers, ethicists have written a lot about what that is and what virtues are, how we acquire them. But so these are three, so maybe the three main theories in normative ethics, um, and it's not decided at all which one is the right one. Um, so to just endorse consequentialism as the right theory is simply highly controversial. There are 
very strong arguments against consequentialism. Of course, consequentialists have tried to come up with answers to those challenges, um, but this is, I mean, this is an ongoing discussion, not something you can simply sidestep. Um, now, okay, sort of related to this, the specific form of consequentialism that he endorses is in terms of well-being. Um, and of course his, his notion of well-being is, is very broad, so it might sort of include everything that could be related to well-being. But it, I mean, it's an open question to what extent or why you would think yeah, so okay, so it's it's a question why you would think that promotion of well-being uh, is the only consequence that matters. Maybe sort of he defines well-being so broadly that there are no other consequences. Everything is sort of ultimately to be understood in terms of well-being. But you might think, well, I mean, what about things like? Um, yeah, it's okay. So it's it's actually difficult to come up with sort of things that might not be included in his very broad definition of well-being. Um, well, so, okay, so something like respecting human rights, for instance. Uh, you might think that's sort of an important consequence. Um, and it's not obviously something that's included in well-being. Well, okay, so maybe he would say, yes, it is, because, you know, uh, um, not violating human rights ultimately leads to more well-being. Right, so maybe there's things to be said here, but it's not just a given. I mean, this would need to be argued for. Um, also, why think that well-being can be cashed out in completely natural terms? So, just in terms of how people feel, uh, their health. I mean, couldn't there be more intangible dimensions to well-being, like a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose? And of course, I mean, he's going to think this is just esoteric, vague stuff. But again, it's not given that well-being <coughs> is this completely natural uh, phenomenon. And of course, the core point here, if you recall the, the quote I gave you, that he came to his conclusions by considering the logical implications of progress in the sciences of the mind, it's just completely unclear how all of this is supposed to follow from the sciences of the mind. I mean, there's no neuroscience that demonstrates that we should only care about well-being. There's no neuroscience that says consequentialism is the right theory. So what exactly is going on there? I mean, to just say that you've considered the progress in the sciences of the mind and that that has somehow led you to adopt consequentialism really is a mysterious thing to say because it just doesn't follow. Um, moreover, I mean, actually sort of this, this expression considering, I mean, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> I mean, it sort of sounds like doing a little philosophy, right? You sort of consider the sciences of the mind and you think about what they mean and what sort of implications they have. Well, that is doing philosophy in a way. So it looks like he's sort of trying to hide the fact that he maybe did engage in a little bit of philosophy. Um, okay, so this is one example. Here's the second one. And Sam Harris, so let me just say this briefly in closing about him. He's, I mean, he's clearly, he's a very sort of strident figure. I mean, he has this aggressive tone um, and, and he's, um, it's sort of, sometimes it can be hard to uh, relate to him. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't seem like a very friendly character in some of his books, at least. Um, so maybe this is, I mean, you might sort of try to explain all this by reference to his character, um, maybe. But anyway, I think we can see clearly that there's sort of scientism at work in, in this book. Now, um, the second character I want to look at is the, um, the primatologist Franz de Waal. Um, he's a much more friendly figure. I mean, he doesn't have any sort of axis to grind. He's not one of those new atheist types who try to bash religion all the time. Um, he thinks you know, we should all get along and uh, religion is a wonderful thing and morality is a wonderful thing. Nonetheless, I think there is an interesting form of scientism at work. So rather than trying to explain the sort of work that he does, I'm going to show you a brief video clip, uh, an excerpt from his TED talk, where he uh, shows something about morality in the animal world. Um, all right, let's see. Here he is, and here goes. The final experiment that I want to mention to you is our family study. Uh, and so this became a very famous study that was now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became very well known. And we did that originally with the Kutcher monkey. And I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. That's now we've done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees. Uh, this is the Messiah Boston who started out with the Kutcher monkeys. 
So what we did is we, we took the pushy monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the bark the grapes, the food preferences of my kombucha monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so, if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who have never done the task yet. They're thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber knows that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly then she sees the other one getting great and we will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. She gets again cucumber. That's amazing, right? <laughs> These monkeys are like, screw you, I'm not going to eat a cucumber if my neighbor gets a grape. <laughs> um, so this is uh, he's really fascinating work. Um, and he's done lots and lots of these sorts of experiments where he shows that animals actually have a very sophisticated and well-developed sense of fairness, of justice. Animals sort of recognize each other's emotions to some extent. They empathize with others. Uh, they, they, they empathize, they sympathize. Um, they try to help each other. And sort of what's really interesting, and of course this is especially true in, in higher primates, like sort of the more sophisticated or developed animals, if you will. Um, but it's fascinating how much, um, how much sort of seemingly moral behavior is actually going on in the animal world. And this is something he's done a really great job of, uh, of bringing to the fore. Um, and what's, so one sort of very striking thing is also that you might think, oh, in animals it's just sort of they, they, they only care about their in-group, like sort of the same animals uh, or the animals sort of that live together. Uh, but actually sometimes you get sort of sympathy and care for out-group members. So it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, all right, so here was the clip, but the audio wasn't right, so we used the other one. Um, so what are some of his uh, key points? So. And this is the work he does. I mean, mostly he is just a primatologist, and he has lots and lots of interesting experimental work. But then he, he also writes sort of popular science books in which he tries to sort of explain these things in more detail and extrapolate from them to, to general concerns about morality. And so the main thing he does is to argue against what he sometimes calls the veneer theory of morality. So there is this traditional view in, in biology and in evolutionary uh, theory that evolution is ultimately all about sort of selfish genes. You know, the term comes from Richard Dawkins. And this is why sort of evolution um, leads to beings, uh, animals, humans, who are deep down completely selfish. Um, and that's sort of our, our real core. That's the view. And then sort of morality is added uh, on top of this as a sort of a thin layer of veneer. So it's this, I mean, if you sort of scratch it, it comes off very easily and we become you know, selfish brutes again. And he thinks that this view is just wrong. 
And that's what he takes all his experimental work to show. There's actually pro-sociality and sort of moral-like behavior in lots of animals. Um, so it's not the case that animals are deep down these selfish beings, they are actually social beings. Um, so there's pro-sociality, fairness, justice, empathy, caring, helping others, uh, all of that. And he, so he goes on to give explanations for that, so he thinks there are sort of mechanisms, neural, psychological mechanisms, that make us empath em emphatic, em em make us have empathy um, for other beings. And this is all sort of hardwired into us. So evolution actually produces social, pro-social, moral beings, and not just selfish beings. That's the core of his view. And we sort of build on these foundations for our contemporary morality. So we expand our circle of empathy even ever more widely to include others and you know, to care about others. Um, so, and this is why, I mean, he takes this to show that science can wrest morality from the hands of philosophers. This is the quote I gave you before. Um, now, some questions for, uh, for De Waal. Because all of this seems very uh, sympathetic, and, it, and it, at any rate, it's very interesting. But the question is, I mean, what does it really have to do, or what does it have to do exactly with ethics? normative ethics in particular. Because um, it still seems there is this distinction between facts and values, between is and ought. And again, I don't take this to be a particularly deep point, but it's a very basic point that the Waal, at least, seems to lose sight of. Um, and so, traditionally, normative ethics is, uh, was, and still is, about how things ought to be, or ought not to be, what you ought to do and ought not to do. Um, and that's something different from what you, in fact, do. Um, well, okay, okay, so sometimes it isn't. When we do the right thing, you know, what we actually do and what we ought to do is the same thing. But uh, we all know there's a difference between how we, in fact, act and how we ought to act, in some cases, at least, for us. Um, we're not saints, right? Oh, at least I'm not a saint. Maybe you are. Um, so the basic point, and this is, and again, this is something you will, you will find in any introductory ethics textbook, and I've just, I mean, this is a random quote from one such introductory book. Um, it just says, well, ethics is about you know, normative questions. What should I do? What sort of person should I be? Um, so it seems that the wow comes close to committing what philosophers call the naturalistic fallacy, so deriving an ought from an is. <coughs> I mean, to be fair, he, he is never really sort of explicit about this, but sort of you get the sense that between the lines there's something like this going on. And here's sort of one case where he seems to be coming pretty close to it. So he writes, human morality develops out of sensitivity to others and out of the realization that in order to reap the benefits of group life, we need to compromise and be considerate of others. Now. It's actually interesting how, um, when you look at this quote, I mean, he wants to argue that we're, so deep down, we're not just selfish beings, but social beings. But of course, when you read this, it looks like we are, in a way, still selfish beings, right? We just realize that in order to promote our own interests better, we need to care about the group uh, and take care of other group members. Um, so I don't know exactly how he sort of reconciles these things, but it, so the point I wanted to make is that what's going on here in this quote is that he's describing what you might call a prudential ought. So if you care about certain things, if you want to reap the benefits of, um, of group life, you need to do certain things. Um, but that's, you know, that's prudence, that's sort of taking care of your interest in the best way that you can. But that's something different from a moral ought, because it's traditionally assumed in, in normative ethics that moral oughts are not conditional on these um, you know, things about your personal interests. So here he says, oh, if you have an interest in reaping certain benefits, you should do so and so. But morality, a lot of philosophers assume, is not dependent on these interests. It's sort of unconditional. You ought to take care of your children, no matter what your interests are. You ought to not lie, no matter what your interests are, and to barring a few sort of exceptional cases. Um, 
So here, I mean, he's, I mean, it looks like he's successfully uh, getting an ought from an is, but it's not morality that he's talking about here, if you look closely. <coughs> now, um, what does this all mean? I think what's going on in De Waal's work, uh, fascinating though it is, is sort of a, a classic bait and switch situation. So he says that he's going to address like a big question, morality, um, the right thing to do. But what he actually does is show us you know, where building blocks or where preconditions for moral behavior come from. Now that's very interesting, but it's not the same thing. Um, so he's basically sort of switching uh, the topic, changing the topic. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? Because I think I've been talking for quite a while now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you probably feel the same way. <laughs> right, so I'll be, I'll quickly uh, close now. Uh, just a few more things. Um, so I said at the beginning that I wanted to um, say something about why this matters. So let me just be real quick about this. I, so I think this matters is because these popular science books play an important role, both to form our opinions in an autonomous and responsible way. But if what we get in terms of information is one-sided, is biased, then we're not able to do that in, a, in the right way, right? So in a way, these popular science books are engaged in mis providing misleading information. And ultimately, and I want to sort of get back to a point that was raised before, um, I think scientism and sort of the way scientism is at work in these books undermines the, the proper authority of science. And why is that? Well, because of two things. Um, first, scientism, or at least adherents of scientism, have this tendency to extrapolate really quickly from the results of current science to grand conclusions about big questions. But of course, I mean, science progresses all the time, uh, and new things are discovered. So that means that some of the extrapolations that were made uh, are going to have to be retracted. So people are going to get the impression that science is changing all the time, whereas what really happened was simply sort of accumulation of new knowledge. People are going to think, oh, now there's sort of scientists are backtracking again, and you know, it's different with morality or free will. So that gives the impression that science is much more um, changeable and, and volatile than it in fact is. And that's bad for the authority of science. Another thing, second thing, uh, is that scientism is often tangled up with naturalistic or physicalistic worldviews, or at least sort of strongly anti-religious worldviews. I mean, Michael is right that this isn't necessary, but it is in fact what happens a lot of the time. Um, and that means that people are going to think that science is necessarily anti-religion or sort of anti-humanities. So for people who care about traditional humanistic endeavors, for people who care about religion, they're going to think that science is a bad thing. Again, I mean, there are quite a number of people who fall under this category, so a lot of people are going to think that science is a bad thing if this is the way scientism is, is promoted. So bad for uh, science. Now, these things I'll just give them to you very quickly and then, and then I'm done. Um, can we do better? I mean, can you write popular science books without assuming scientism or without the influence of scientism? I think you can, and there are sort of, I could give you examples um, if you wanted. So th this is, I mean, these are just four very basic guidelines, and they're, they're slightly trivial, but as we've seen, they're still violated frequently. So first, first point, don't say you're going to write about the big questions if you won't. Uh, and this is more or less what happens with the wow, right? I mean, he says he's going to talk about morality, but he really talks about something slightly different or related. Um, distinguish between the actual science and the conclusions or the extrapolations that you draw from actual science. And also make it explicit how you get from the science to the extrapolations. So with Sam Harris, right, he just says, oh, you know, I considered the progress in the sciences of the mind. Well, we'd like to know a little bit more about what the argument is there. And if, if that's made explicit in popular science books, readers can do a better job of forming their own opinions and of looking at those arguments to see whether they're good arguments. Uh, conceptual analysis, thinking carefully about the concepts you use, very important. I gave you those crazy definitions of free will. It could have easily been avoided by just looking at an introductory philosophy book. 
And maybe, I mean, this is something that some people are not going to want to accept, but maybe it's sort of an option that there are limits to what science can do. And you know, some examples that people often give are, you know, science, it doesn't look like science is ever going to be able to say anything about normative questions. Um, things like the existence of God may be not a scientific issue. Uh, meaning or sort of the second personal perspective, how to relate to other people, doesn't look like the sort of thing that science is going to teach you a lot about. Maybe. So all these examples are controversial. But, I mean, it's, it's possible, right, that there are limits to science. And that should be sort of on the map there. All right, I'll close here. Um, thank you all very much for listening to me for such a long time. <laughs>